Right, oh, we're away. Um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity again, Steve, to uh, have a talk to you about some of the um, yield monitoring uh, and precision ag, why it's important, and I guess pre-harvest, what 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 sort of things should we be looking for, and what sort of things should we be doing to uh, make sure we've got good quality data. Um, I guess starting at the why do we actually need good quality data? You know. Um, I think half the problem with yield monitoring is that people don't sort of think it's of any value. So they sort of, it's the last thing on the list when you're harvesting, which is understandable because you're trying to get the crop in and you're trying to make money. So, you know, um, it, it's sort of at the back of the list, but you know, more and more people are respecting that the yield data is critically important for their business going forward. And I think things like if you're doing any sort of trials, obviously you need to be well calibrated on the monitor. Uh, otherwise you're, you're not really getting the data that you need. And I'm, you know, this in the last sort of one to two years, we've seen a massive increase in the amount of trials that people are doing. So there's certainly a big push in the market to, to actually use precision ag type tools to, to do trials. And you need good quality data uh, to make sense of that and, and do your cost benefits and those kinds of things if you're doing fertilizer trials or, or, new, or whatever, you, whatever you might be doing. Um, Obviously for things like variable rate applications when you're doing a replacement, uh, something like phosphate, um, probably more in the south than in the north, but um, where you are replacing kilograms per tonne of grain, if your tonnes of grain are not right, then your, your application rates aren't gonna be right, are they? So it's, it's important if you're doing a replacement sort of um, scenario that you, that, you, um, that you have good quality data in that respect. Um, the other thing we, we, now that yield monitors have been around a long time, um, people are asking us to put multiple years of data together to see these long-term trends, not, not just with satellite imagery, but also with yield. Now, often we find that we get a big USB stick full of data and, you know, they might have 10 years of data and probably two or three of those are actually usable. And that's not very handy for doing a 10 year analysis or a five year analysis if you've got one or two years. So having good quality data means that you can do those kinds of analysis. Without that, you've, it's basically garbage in, garbage out, as you, as you, as you can understand. Um, and I think it's also, it's, it's just giving the grower confidence in the result so that, that what they're seeing on their, on their, on their um, Weybridge tickets is the same as what's coming out of the monitor. That gives people a lot of um, confidence in the, in the result that they're, they're actually receiving. So I think uh, people need to see that, that that represents what they what they see in the Weybridge. And if you've got bigger and bigger properties like corporate properties, then this might be your only measure of of what's coming out of each field because of of so much logistics problems um, with trucks and and machines going everywhere. Uh, you might have five or ten contractors. Well, this might be your only measure of double checking what actually came off the paddock. So. If you haven't got good quality calibrated yield data, then you're going to get a really mismatched uh, outcome when it comes to checking, you know, all the loads of grain that come off the farm during harvest time because it's very, very busy, as you know. Um, and we, for many years, we've been using yield data for for disputes, and and even a few in your local area this year, which I won't mention any names, but um, you know, a lot of people come to us with you know spray drift disputes and again if you've it's about confidence in that data if you haven't got good confidence in that data then you you you're not asking for the right amount of money so it just it just helps sort those sort of disputes out as well uh, i find um so i'm, I'm going to go back to the basics again of of yield monitoring because uh once you understand how these things work it's a bit like a gps system if you know how it sort of works then you can you can uh, sort of diagnose any problems pretty quickly. Um, you might not be able to fix them if you're not the manufacturer, but at least you've got an idea what might be causing errors in the data in the first instance or, or tips to get good quality data. Um, so there's multiple components. And obviously one of the most important things is the GPS receiver so you know where you are in the paddock. Otherwise it's just a, um, you know, many, obviously many headers have yield monitors, but not the ability to do yield mapping. So they monitor the yield, but they don't record it and they don't have any spatial reference. 
So that's fine if you just want to know what the average yield of the paddock was, but it's not much good if you want to produce a yield map. So the GPS is absolutely critical in that and, and um, you know, it needs to be working effectively. And not, obviously now with most new headers, this is all fully integrated, right? It's just not an add-on system like, like in the past. Um, the, the, the other most important thing, obviously, is the grain, uh, the, the mass volume sensor and the grain moisture sensor. Now, the, the, the mass volume sensor is, is the sort of critical component. Um, now, as you can imagine, we're actually not measuring the yield. We're not weighing the grain as it's coming through. What it's doing is it's hitting an impact plate and it's forcing, the grain's getting forced up against that impact plate. And I'll show a photo of this in a minute. But that, that, the, the, the harder it's getting hit, the more grain it's coming through. So it's measuring the flow of, of a product. It's not measuring the weight. So that's why uh, the calibration is so important because it's actually not weighing the grain. Uh, and I'll talk about the two different types of sensors that are available. Um, but, you know, work we're doing in other crops, we're actually weighing the product. So there is no calibration, really. It's, it's a weight. So that's why calibration is even more important in a grain harvester because we're actually not measuring the weight. Um, for most of the, sense, uh, the yield monitors on the market, you also need grain moisture. Uh, obviously, as the moisture changes, the density changes and, and the flow characteristics change. So uh, almost all monitors need moisture content to calibrate properly. So if your moisture sensor is playing up, you're going to get really crappy yield data because it's absolutely you know, relied on to, to provide that calibration. Um, and there is, I'll, again, I'll talk about the two different types of sensors. One of them does need moisture and the other one doesn't. Um, the other thing is there's a comb sensor. So as the comb goes up and down, it can turn the monitoring on and off, which makes a lot of sense because if you want to come to the end of the field and you lift up, you want it to turn off and stop monitoring. Sometimes that's not set properly. Um, it's probably not a big drama nowadays, but in early machines, this was a big problem because there was a little spring underneath there and a switch. And if that spring and switch wasn't set properly, it would just keep monitoring all the way up the road. Um, so not really ideal. You don't want to have to clean out lots of data. If we can just stop collecting it when we don't need it, well, then it makes the job of cleaning it a hell of a lot easier. Um, obviously, there's, there is speed sensors, but obviously nowadays with GPS, most of that's dealt with with GPS and not a speed sensor. But it's another thing that can fail um, on, on the wheel magnetic speed sensor. So it's another thing that could go wrong and you're not getting good data and you don't know why. Well, it, it could just sort of be not counting because if you think about a calibration, right? Oh, oh, sorry, a, a measurement of, of yield. It's the mass flow coming through the machine. It's the width of the, of the cutter bar. So how wide are we cutting? Um, and the speed that we're traveling. So how far have we traveled? So we get a square meter, so it's nine meter wide front. We've traveled five meters, so it's not 45 square meters and we've got this much grain coming through. So that's how it calculates the tons per hectare. So it's, it's using all of those combinations to, to calculate that and hence why things like comb width are also important. Is there any questions on that at all at this stage? Uh, we're good, Tim, I think. Um, like I said, there's a couple of different types. Um, and this, this is a schematic of sort of what the impact plate looks like and I'll, I'll show you an actual real one in a minute, but flows up the clean grain elevator and hits the impact plate and, and, and goes into the grain bin. So <clears throat> if you can imagine what you've got to keep in mind in that case is this is right at the top of the clean grain elevator. So you could go 50 metres into the paddock before grain really starts appearing in the bin. As you know, like it, you, you hook in for the first time and it takes quite a while for the grain to flow into the bin. So keep that in mind that this yield data is an average of an average of an average. It's, it's a constant measure, so it's not this point in time, like you, you go back to our machine, you know, some of the grain comes straight in, straight through uh, and up the elevator uh, without doing, you know, too much cleaning. Uh, it, it, it's gonna end up in the, in the sensor very quickly, whereas something that's, say, right out on the width of the, full width of the comb, nine metres out, or sorry, four and a half metres out, uh, or even a 12 metre front, you're six metres. So that grain's got to go six metres into the, into the um, elevators and through the cleaning process uh, and might go across the walkers a couple of times before it hits the sensor. So some grain's going to go straight to the sensor and some's going to take quite a while. 
So again, keep this in mind that this is not an exact science because it's averaging all of that as it flows through the machine. And it, um, <clears throat> as you know, as you start off, it's taken quite a while for that grain to fully come through the machine. So just keep that in mind as well. Um, and, and just its location on the machine means it's getting grain quite old, uh, probably even up to 50 meters into the field. Some of that grain is, net, is still entering that, that sensor. Hence why when I recommend you make a trial that we trim off 50 meters either end of the trial. So don't make your trials 100 meters long because by the time the grains got in there and got out again, uh, your trial's over with. So that's why strip trials are really good. Full length of the paddock might be a kilometer long um, and therefore you're getting a nice good stream of yield data for the whole strip. We trim off the ends of 50 meters and that way we've got a good quality sample. Um, Similarly, if you're going to make your trials wide, make them three runs of the header wide. Don't make them one run of the header wide because there's so much noise in that data that you're not quite sure whether you're getting a good quality trial outcome. So that's why I recommended a trial that's three widths of the header and as long as you can. Like you might not want to do the whole length of the field. And some growers complain because a oh, zero end strip is going to cost me a lot of money if it's a kilometre wide by, you know, 27 metres. A uh, kilometre long by 27 metres wide, I'm um, losing a lot of grain. So keep that in mind, obviously. And if it's a spray trial with, you know, a, a residual product or, you know, you're going to get weeds, well, it's not ideal either. So I guess you've got to keep that in context. But this, this is why it's important to have trials of reasonable size because when you come to monitor it, it takes a long time for that grain to come through the machine. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, the, so probably 90% of machines have got this kind of monitor on them uh, and they're all essentially developed by the same person originally, the same group. Um, so they're pretty much similar across all machines. There's a little bit of nuances now uh, given um, manufacturers are building their own things, but yeah, essentially they're all the same type of, uh, type of uh, unit. The second type of unit is this uh, optical sensors, as the one you see down here. These were originally developed by a country, company called RDS in, in the UK. Um, now Trimble has bought the, the rights to those. So anyone that's got Trimble um, and a couple of your clients have, I know, um, they're an optical sensor. So they fit across um, the clean grain elevator. So as go back to our diagram, they fit about here somewhere. So as the grain goes up the pa uh, elevator on the paddles, it's looking across the paddles to see how full they are. So that so it's a light, it's an infrared light. So it's shining across the clean grain elevator. So the darker it is, the more grains on the paddles. The lighter it is, uh, there's less grain on the paddle. Um, so that's how it works. And it doesn't need moisture to calibrate. And it's a very, very simple calibration of one hectolitre weight. Uh, and that's it, it's done. Whereas, these traditional type of impact plate monitors require the three to five loads of calibration what we're going to talk about in a minute. So it's a shame that these never took off because they're a hell of a lot more easy to install. They're a hell of a lot more easy to calibrate. Um, they obviously have their own problems. One of the problems is, I'm getting too much into detail, sorry, but one of the problems is that on a sloping land, the, the grain falls off the paddles as, it, you know, if you change your angle, therefore they needed a slope sensor in them to calibrate properly but that's that's by the by so they do have a little slope sensor but on the regular uh, gym ball plug plane uh, not really a problem if you work in a hilly country then it's a big problem so um, that was the only problem with those sort of light sensors and we've I've used these in, in even nut crops in nut harvesters to actually do yield monitoring in them because it's paddle it's it's nuts going over paddles on a on a conveyor belt so you know there's lots of uses for those types of things um, different kind of moisture sensors. Uh, this is another moisture sensor here, takes a sample, does a, does a, um, uh, a moisture reading. Uh, all your protein sensors look the same. They take a sample out of the clean grain elevator. They, they do, it takes them, what, three or four or five seconds to do the infrared uh, protein reading, and then it drops that sample back into the clean grain elevator. So that's how the moisture sensors, some of them work continuously where they, they, they're just like this one here is just the grain flow over the sensor measures the moisture content. Uh, very, very smart technology. Um, been around a long time now. Uh, this, this picture up the top right is a, it's the same light sensors down here in the bottom left, but 
but in a cotton um, cotton picker. So that's the the shoots uh, going up the into the into the basket, and the the light sensor shines a beam across the the the, the flow of cotton, and you can imagine the darker it is, the more cotton's flowing past. So that's how the cotton yield monitors work. Uh, so it's not based on the same technology. Very simple, but works tremendously well. Um, obviously, you've got to clean the little lenses occasionally because they do get dirty with different crops. If you've got a lot of, say, sorghum with um, with with um, with the honeydew, um, with um, what do you call ergot. it again? Sorry, ergot. ergot. Say you got ergot. Uh, you can imagine these little light beams here are going to get all clogged up with ergot. So, and South Australia it's snails, right? They harvest snails and they, they provide a really good mess up all the, through the header components and one of them is the monitor. So just keep that in mind if you've got those kinds of sensors that um, be careful, they need to be cleaned occasionally. Um, obviously in the cab, there's lots of screens and you know, 90% of tractors and 99% of tractors now got a screen in them. And so normally that's where the monitoring's going on. Obviously there's aftermarket options, but also most stuff's fully integrated nowadays, as you know, with you know, with any machine you buy, the yield monitor is fully integrated. The GPS is fully integrated. You get the screen. Um, you unlock all the functions and features on that screen. It does everything. Um, so, yeah, that's 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 probably where you're going to be interacting with. Um, and you know, getting yield data off is a fairly straightforward process. It's not something to be sort of afraid of. I guess it's 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 a fairly straightforward process to get data off that. Um, we've also developed a little device uh, this season that goes on the back and we're testing with one of your customers this year that um, it, it plugs into the USB port and sits at the back and it automatically transmits the data um, to, to uh, our servers that we can just pull the data down without putting a USB stick in or, or doing anything like that. Um, you might have also seen the CAN bus devices that plug into the the CAN bus on the, on the harvesters. Uh, companies like Farmer's Edge had one, uh, Farm Marble have one that I've tested. Uh, they pull the data directly off the CAN bus, which is the sort of the brains and the, and the nervous system of the, of the machine, not the screen. And I'm, I've also always been a bit fearful of those kinds of devices because they're really interfering with the actual electronics network of the machine. Whereas working with a USB stick, you're working with a screen, which is a fairly safe place to be. Um, so I think it's a better solution and you'll see more of those kinds of solutions coming. If you've got a, if you've got a customer that's very much a, a John Deere customer, then they'll have my John Deere and operations center, which now all this data flows automatically to, um, uh, wirelessly, um, so that you can pick it all up off there. And, and that's obviously going to be the future, uh, but a lot of old machines out there, I think it's, it's a 10 year turnover cycle before we see full every machine having a uh, connected wireless um, you know, data facility to pull that data straight off the machine rather than going out and plugging a USB stick in. Uh, is there any questions on those sort of screens and monitoring types? Uh, all good. All good, it makes sense. Yep. I, hope that, I, hope it, uh, I hope it's not, I'm not trying to you know, confuse all technical jargon but it's it, it, it helps understand if there's a problem where do i start looking you know where, what what could be the cause of that problem um yeah um when we do pull the data off you know it's it really is just a csv excel spreadsheet it's it's there's nothing uh tremendously exciting about it but what you can see in there hopefully you can see on your screen you've got an x and y coordinate obviously that's really important to know where it is uh, the field, it gives it all the numbers and and obviously the product is sorghum in this case. Um, the swath width, so that's the width of the machine. So they put in 8.89 metres. Now, you can imagine if that's incorrect, that's going to have a massive impact on, on the reading, isn't it? Like I explained before, it's the distance. Here, look, there's the distance. 1.88 times 8.89, that's the number of square metres. That, that machine's traveled in 0 0.00028 of a uh, whatever duration that is that's probably in uh, gps clock time or something um so you know it's it's the distance that's traveled by the width uh gives us the area um of of cut uh then 
we look at, if we just go across to flow, there's, uh, the flow is sort of blanked out there, it doesn't matter. Um, you, you, your flow reading comes in then and it does this calibration on the fly. The moisture content, oh, there's the flow, moisture content. And then on the final columns is a yield mass and a yield volume. So what you, when you want to look at this data, you want to look at the yield mass dry. So it gives you four columns, yield mass wet, yield mass dry, yield volume dry, and yield volume wet. The one we really, I take most notice of is the yield mass dry because it's already calculating for, for the moisture content um, and it converts everything back to 12% moisture content. Okay, so if, you, if there's parts of the paddock that are 17%, it draws down those those readings back to a co consistent, <coughs> excuse me, consistent moisture content reading. So that's the column that you want to look at is yield mass dry because it's it's, it's calibrated everything above twelve percent back down to twelve percent. So it's got a, it's much more um, uh, it's comparing apples and apples if you know what I mean um, because that moisture content is going to change the weight obviously. Um, and you want to know, regardless of the moisture, what that weight is, if that makes sense. So you just assume that it brings it down from 17 to 12 percent. Does it do it the other way? It no, up? no, it doesn't. So anything that's say 10 percent, it doesn't bring it up to 12 percent. Yeah. Um, don't ask me why, but that's just what it does. It doesn't add water to areas that needed it. So. Um, yeah, for some reason it doesn't do that, um, unless they've changed that, but that's how it used to be. So, I mean, mostly in Queensland, as you know, you, you're harvesting when it's actually, yeah, bloody dry anyway, so it's not a big problem. But if you're in rice, for example, and we have a lot of rice clients, you know, they're harvesting up around, they start harvest at 20%. Um, so, you know, this becomes increasingly very important because, you know, uh, that's, you know, 8% weight difference um, because of moisture content, not because of the grain weight, the kernel weight, if you know what I mean. So it becomes in, incredibly important um, to, to get that right. And again, once again, if your moisture, if your moisture uh, sense is not reading right, then that's gonna be, gonna give you some really strange results. So if you've got stuff coming in, say one end of the paddock's 10%, the other end's 12, does that skew your data at all? Um, I guess it's not skewing it, it's telling you exactly what's there, but I guess you've got to keep in mind that, yeah, the drier, the drier kernels are, uh, are weighing less, aren't they? So, yeah, um, just keep, I guess you've got to keep that in mind because you can, you can print, you can do a moisture map. You, yeah. Like there's the moisture readings there. <clears throat> you know, you could just produce a map of moisture content. I've done that a number of times. And some of the data I looked at from one of your clients the other day, there's all this striping in the data. <clears throat> and when I looked at it, it was different. It was because it was harvested over different days. But uh, I think some of that was also a moisture, moisture impact. Um, so yeah, it, it can skew the data for sure. And with cotton, for example, it's, it's very important. So, um, you know, it needs to be taken into account. Yeah. Any other questions on that? Uh, we Um, often we see this where there's two headers in the paddock, one with monitoring, one without, and you know you'll get you get all this gappiness, uh, and it's pretty hard because you've got to ask the computer now to interpolate between this point and this point, and that's what's that about six runs, so six eight six nines of fifty meters, you know, it's not very good quality data that you can really rely on. So <clears throat> where you can, it's it's a good idea to, I mean. Contractors are just not going to do it because they're in the heat of harvest. But if you could skip row, well, that would that would be okay. Um, you know, you could fill in those gaps. But bridging in 50 meters is just not going to be very useful. Uh, either that, or you, if you, uh, I see this time and time again. People go to all the efforts of putting a trial in, and then the monitor, uh, the the sorry, the harvester without the monitor goes and harvests that paddock, and you go. Bloody hell, we've taken all year to get this trial in and then you've gone and used the header without the yield monitor on the bloody paddock. So, you know, if you have got a trial, make sure that you say like, we need this monitored, you know, don't use the headers without yield monitoring. 
it, it sounds stupid, but I've seen it time and time and time again because there's a heat of harvest and people forget and, and end up with no data after all your hard work. So it's, 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 um, it's worthwhile putting the effort in to make sure that happens. You don't see this much anymore, clearly, uh, because people are using GPS up and back. But if people are going round and round, you can see that, you know, you're creating false data by having that sort of harvesting pattern and, you know, people doing the final run up the middle of a paddock here. Uh, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but in the middle of that paddock, you can see a low reading. Well, we've just got to get in and clean all that out, which is a pain in the backside because, you know, you, you can't, it's very hard to select that out because it's not zero yield. It's half a cone width or a quarter of a cone width just to get that last run. And, you know, it, it's not showing zero yield. So I can't just go and clean out all the zeros. We have to manually clean that out. It's really painful. So having good quality practices when you're harvesting is going to give good quality data. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time. Um, you know, good quality data looks like this where you've got consistent, even results. It's well calibrated and you can now start to rely on that information. And that's how the raw yield data comes. Obviously, what we do then is interpolate between all these points to give you nice, smooth looking, pretty maps. But that's how the raw data sits. I often like to present, actually in most cases, I'll present this back to the grower because, or the agronomist, because you can, I think, get more out of an uninterpolated un, uh, map than you can with a fully prettied up one. Because you can see all the harvesting patterns, you can see uh, impacts a lot better and, and I believe it's a better way of giving data back to growers anyway. So why is it important to calibrate and this these charts I've just dragged off the internet but um, you know th it's not a straight line uh, 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 it's not a straight line impact uh, effect from a monitor to the actual yield. <clears throat> As you can imagine it's the flow characteristics as they change in the machine onto that impact plate, as we talked about at the start, as the flow characteristics change, um, the, the, the way the sensor reads it changes. So we do need to do multiple points of calibration each season for each crop. And this is the reason. If, if we were to do two points, um, you can see here on the left uh, that we're overestimating our, our readings considerably because uh, we've got a straight line uh, calibration when in fact the dots show how the actual calibration, I mean, how the actual readings are occurring. So as the monitor is calibrating, um, it, it's not calibrating, sorry, it's, it's, it's doing its calculations every couple of seconds, you know, it needs to, it needs to be able to give it the right correct uh, result for that, for that flow rate at that particular point in the paddock. And, and as you can see here, if you, if you calibrate it in four places, the low flow right through to high flow, the calibration curve, if you like, or calibration lines are much better suited to, as the flows change through the paddock with the yield, then you're gonna get a much more accurate reading. And, and that's the reason why we need to calibrate so much <clears throat> is because it's not a straight line relationship. <clears throat> Um, we're trying to get down to less than 5% error and I've calibrated machines. We've got to 2%. So it is achievable. Um, people say to me, oh, how accurate is a yield monitor? I say, well, they can be 2% accurate <clears throat> if you calibrate them properly. If you don't, well, you could be 20% out. So uh, there's also an argument to say, oh, well, just give me the load tickets at the end of the season and I'll, I'll just drop all, say, say the paddock averaged, um, 5.5 and the monitor said five. Well, let's just drop it every, everything by 10%. Well, it actually doesn't work like that because that's, if I go back to the average, that would be here. The high and low flows actually can be quite different as well. So the yield necessarily doesn't equal in the high and low. It won't be right, even though you've just calibrated for the average. I don't know if I explained that very well, but <clears throat> often people think they can just post calibrate with an average yield. Well, yes, you can, but the problem is that the high and low ends of that paddock aren't going to be correct. The yields aren't going to be right. Um, whether you get too antsy about that or not, <clears throat> up to you. I mean, I've done hundreds of paddocks of calibrated on an average yield, but, um, you know, and got 10% error. So I know that the highs and lows are going to be wrong, but, you know, they wanted to look at the relativity across the paddock, uh, you know, in that case. Um, 
obviously crop types critical because <clears throat> each crop's going to have its own curve, isn't it? <clears throat> you know, it's uh, chickpeas are very very different flow characteristics to wheat, so <clears throat> each crop has to be has to be calibrated, and therefore it needs to be selected correctly in the machine. Many times we see data coming back in the you know that's that's um, they've put a it, it, it comes you know back in the data you could see the crop type so I know when a crop type comes in they picked the wrong crop type you know they've been harvesting chickpeas and they go straight into a wheat crop and the calibrations go to custard well that's the reason because the calibration curves are completely different um, we normally like to do three to five calibration lo uh, loads each season at the start of the season with a reliable weigh bridge so um, <clears throat> sometimes that's really challenging and I get that like it the way bridge might be 20 minutes drive away. But if you want good quality data, you have to go to this effort. And that's just a sad, that's just the reality of it. I mean, a lot of farms have got their own bridges now, which is great. But, you know, this is the sort of effort you need to go to. Many growers will calibrate once and never calibrate again for the whole whole life of the machine. But just keep in mind, if you're going to do that, you're going to get, you could get average data. Um, the key th things here is, is getting different flow characteristics through the sensor. So we need to drive uh, either at different speeds or using different widths. Um, so you can do it two different ways. And if you're on controlled traffic, then the guys aren't gonna want you driving all over the paddocks. So this is probably the most logical way is that you drive at really, really slow speeds. Um, and that will simulate a light crop and the, fl and the flow coming into the sensor will be a light crop. Then you speed up and go super fast and you load that sensor up, you know, and then you're getting the top end. So the sensor's then getting grain pouring into it and it's getting the top end and you're getting all those characteristics through the way. So you do a slow run, unload it. Do a uh, medium speed run, unload it uh, and weigh it. Do a fast run, uh, unload it. So that's how you get those three, three to five calibration points. Does that make sense? <coughs> yep. Any questions on that? Um, we talked about moisture medias. Um, I've also seen this where people calibrate halfway through a paddock. Really painful because I'm going to try and work out how to actually, I don't know exactly where they calibrate. You can sort of see it, uh, but how do I adjust it? How do I know it's not a normal paddock effect? You know, so generally tend to try and do it um, at the start of the paddock. Um, there is certain monitors and a lot of them might do it now where it retrospectively recalibrates everything that was done. Again, just check with the manufacturer on that, but sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, what I mean by that is if you harvest the stuff yesterday, well, it cal recalibrates all that back yesterday, but uh, often it won't. It'll be only what's going forward. So just don't rely on that. Um, the, the things like the seeing eye sensor, they need to be calibrated at zero. Why? Because the paddles are gonna show up, aren't they? And with no grain coming through, they need to be zeroed out. So the light, dark, light, dark, you know, the, the ones I talked about that shine through the clean grain elevator, they, you just run them at zero to calibrate them uh, because the paddles are gonna give you some of the darkness. Uh, they're gonna block the light. So you need to zero that out. That's your zero reading. That's why on those Trimble ones, you do a zero calibration. There's also other ones that do it for a vibration point of view. So that impact plate at the top I talked about if the machine's just running normally, there's a certain amount of vibration in there that it's picking up. So you might need to look at that. Just depends on what the, the manual says. Um, there is a thing, I don't know if anyone's seen it, there's, a, there's a, a manual that you get with the machine. It's yeah, about this thick. It's got really good information about how to do this stuff. Not about 1% of people read it um, and uh, it sits under the seat, right? <laughs> As you know. So I think, um, it, when it, they're very, they're quite well explained on how to do this stuff in the manuals um, and it's fairly straightforward. So I think that's probably a good place to start is to read the manufacturer's manual on that. Um, and again, if you've got, a, if you've got a, uh, someone like a, a contractor that's gone from central Queensland to, to Victorian border, well, he's gonna need to recalibrate again because he's got you know, hundreds of thousands of hectares going through his machine. So, and he's going to see all sorts of crops and, 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 and conditions. So he's going to need to recalibrate regularly during the season. Whereas a farmer on his own probably won't need to recalibrate during that season. Does that make sense? 
Um, this is the impact plate that we talked about before. Um, this is what's doing the monitoring. It's like a load cell. Um, and crops like chickpeas wear this out a lot. So if, if you've had a grower that's had a, a, um, a header for five years, done a lot of peas, then I'd be getting up and checking this um, at, at the top of the elevator because uh, the, the, the abrasive crops like chickpeas will do more damage. So again, what happens if your plate's worn out? Your, your flow characteristics are going to be completely wrong. Your monitor is going to be reading low um, for, and you, you don't know why. So, and could be giving inconsistencies too. So that you, you, you do need to check for wear. And, and I guess as a part of a normal um, manufacturer's, uh, you know, dealer comes out and checks your machine prior to harvest, they should be checking for the wear plate, um, for the impact plate as well for any wear on that sensor. Um, I guess some other tips is if you've got a card full on the machine, a lot of growers will start harvesting and they go, the card's full, hit delete, you know, and you've just lost all your previous year's yield data. So it's a good idea just to get in, download, back up all that data before harvest. Um, with, again, check them, check the manual, um, but often, uh, depends on the machine, but generally a John Deere Trimble machines, you put in a clean USB and you can just hit, uh, send all data to the USB and it will push it all. Uh, in, in the case of CNH machines, um, the USB stays in the machine all the time. So you need to turn the machine off, pull the USB out, go and download the data. Uh, I had a, a really bad example the other day, a uh, poor guy, a contractor, his USB um, uh, crapped itself halfway uh, through and he hadn't downloaded any data from that whole harvest and He's basically lost all of his clients' data uh, for the whole season because he hadn't gone and cleaned it and downloaded it. So, um, and it was a it was a problem in the USB stick, and we we were unable to recover that data. So he wasn't real happy, and it said it's the first time it's happened in his whole whole uh, sort of yield monitoring career, <laughs> but it, it can happen. So just keep that in mind. Um, some monitors have restrictions on the USB size. So if you put in a bigger one, it won't, it won't log to it. Uh, it's not, it's less of a problem now, but it's been a problem in the past where you, the old data cards used to be limited on their size. Uh, USBs can be the same, but just check with the dealer or with the manual. Um, often the dealer also do any software or firmware upgrades. I, I, I think half the time that causes most of the problems, but I, I'm not, I can't say that. Um, sometimes when things are work, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But often they'll do a software upgrade and then you get all these problems. So I guess test it out before you start the heat of harvest if there's any 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 updates needed and if there's any glitches in that software. I uh, talked about the machine width already. Obviously, you now know why that's really important. If the machine width's ended wrong, your, your yield data is going to be completely crap. Um, and it takes a lot of post calibrating that to get that right. Uh, people get stuck probably more in the south where they go from a swathing front to a back to the harvesting front. That's where I see most problems occur. Um, you can get late. There's a lag setting in there. You know, I talked about it could take 50 meters before the grain comes to the monitor. Well, there's a little lag setting that's built in to the machine to try and line up that data because of that lag. And if that's if that it's about set at about seven seconds, I think from memory, but if it's not set right, you'll get the sawtooth effect as you go up and back in the paddock because of that lag. And, and as you go one way and the other, it gets bigger. So just, uh, if you do get sawtoothing, what we call sawtoothing backwards and forwards in your data, then that's probably because of that lag effects not set correctly. Um, the other thing is that to help, like you can imagine, this, is, this happens on 100% occasions when you've got contractors, that a guy lobs into a farm, and it's it, it's into Charlie's paddock, right? Everyone's got a river paddock, and or a Charlie's paddock. And if you one guy spells it Charlie Charlie paddock versus Charlie's paddock, well, all of a sudden we have now got two paddocks because the monitor just thinks there's two paddocks, not one. So if you're able to preload all your farms and fields onto a clean USB for a contractor to come in, and then when he leaves, you just take it, take the USB, 
you've all of your all of your data is going to be lined up with the farms and the fields that you've already got in in your software you know so it makes a lot of sense i, I i've spent so many t hours pouring over data just because someone's typed in the paddock name a little bit wrong and it creates another paddock and then you've got to try and merge all that data together it's an absolute pain so it, a preloaded usb with farms and fields in it is a really good way of doing that and and a great piece of software to do that is Ag Leader SMS. Um, you can get a free version of this um, and, and, and get a lot more functionality as you pay more. But this is a simple way that if, you, if you're excited to do this kind of thing, um, you can, you can pre pull in all of the, the paddocks from the grower. You can tidy them all up here. And this is on the left. It's, a bit, it's very blurry, sorry. But you have the, the grower, the farm, and the field, and then the year. So it's grower farm field year activity. So it goes the grower, the farm, the field, 2019 grain harvest. So that's how it's organized in these systems, right? So if you if you change the field name because the contractor punches in the wrong thing into the screen, or even even if he adds a capital P into you know paddock, it's gonna it's gonna add a new paddock. So it gets very painful to then to re-clean all this and put it all back into the right field field structure. Um, and so you can then load up from the grower and then push this, just the, just the farms and field names back to the USB in the right format. Very, very simply with this program, very simply. Um, and that way the growers, it's already preloaded and they're ready to go for harvest. So I'd strongly recommend that happening or ring a, um, a precision ag guy or ring the dealer to get that done for you. Um, because that will make the cleaning and preparation of data in the future a heck of a lot easier if it's in the right in the right paddock. Obviously, as time progresses, we'll get smarter and smarter with this, where it will automatically detect which field it's in, and there is some programs to do that already. But it's a good practice to do this in the first place. So that's um, that's all I've got. Is there is there any questions or anything that I missed? Uh, anything that's been a bit confusing that we can go over again. Well, I think you've um, you've covered it all, Tim. Thanks very much.